greet you again, my dear Christian brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to continue where I left off the last meeting, and I've been giving some things, well, starting with the book of Ezra, that are pertinent to an experience I had and saints I met with had back in 1960, 61, and 62. It was perhaps a, a great highlight and experience in our association together as Christians and a beautiful opportunity to witness to the truthfulness and reality of the church which is Christ's body and that Christians can successfully walk in this day and time even in light of our federal courts and the reality and practicality of the church that Jesus Christ is building. Uh, the reason I was going back to Ezra was to use his experience and their experience at that time as somewhat of a parallel to our experience. Uh, and it's biblical to do that. You may remember that when Jesus Christ was firmly being rejected by the clerics of his day, he gave a very interesting parable. And that's recorded for us in Matthew 12, starting at verse 43. Uh, let me read it to you. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I'll return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he finds it empty, swept and garnished. Wow, all cleaned up. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and he enters in and dwells there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now, what's his purpose in giving that? The next sentence. Even so shall it be with this wicked generation. Oh, so this parable has its parallels in the nation of Israel culminating with that generation. Well, Bible teachers have probably correctly analyzed this and said, well, it's a picture of Israel's history. Uh, they had the devil of demon of idolatry. It plagued them and they spent, it, it was cast out. They went into captivity for seven year, 70 years and they came back under the leadership of Ezra, Nehemiah. They cleaned the house out swept and garnished it. They went back and practiced the word of God again. And in the process of time, however, seven other demons worse than the first. Perhaps that could be illustrated by uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees and their organization. And there was others as well. One was ritualistic and literalistic, supposedly, and then the other one was very, very liberal. But it ended up with their total rejection of Jesus Christ. And so Bible teachers will usually give that as the application to it. Some will go a step further, like uh, this book I have, The New Testament for English Readers by Henry Alfred. He was the, a well-known, outstanding Greek scholar and wrote extensively on the interpretation of scripture. He says, it's also a fact that this parable has a striking resemblance to what happened in Christendom. The history of the Christian church, and others have observed this, he said, runs in a similar course. Not long after the apostolic times, the golden calves of idolatry were set up by the church of Rome. And then there's a period that follows that they often call the church's Babylonian captivity when they were put in prisons and so forth. And then there was the spectacular Reformation 
when they came out of that captivity. But as that Reformation progressed in time and continued in history, we have again the plague of conservatives and liberals and their cataclysmic debate with each other. And again, the slow deterioration of the Church of Jesus Christ right up until this present time. So they say, obviously, this parable has a double application, both with the past and with the future. Now, I was pointing out in the story of Ezra similarity with what is happening or did happen to us back in 1960, 61, 62. Uh, remember, the story of Ezra is really a very beautiful story. About uh, 4, 40,000 people came out under the first leader, Zerub uh, yeah, Zerubbabel, and then later Ezra came out and followed him. And I pointed out how that when they did build the foundation of the temple, Ezra 3, uh, verse 11, that they shouted with a great shout. And when and then they praised the Lord. That's both with song and with praise because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And I brought out that that's a very beautiful, thrilling expression of their joy in the truth of restoring for themselves the use of the temple once again that they're rebuilding. Of course, when you look back at what happened prior to Israel's uh, departure, you see almost the horror of what had happened to that temple when the people... Uh, departed in apostasy from God. Perhaps that's illustrated for us in Ezekiel chapter 9. And this is going to be God's judgment upon Israel because of their desecration of the temple. Israel 9, 1. The messenger calls out to Ezekiel with a loud voice saying, let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. These are going to be angels of destruction. Suddenly six men came forward, their faces northeast, and each had a battle axe in his hand. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where it had been to the outside threshold of the temple. And he, or the Lord, called to the man clothed with linen, who had the rider's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the forehead of the men who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done within it, within this temple. And he goes on to say, Go throughout, beginning with the temple here, utterly slay the old and young men, maidens, and little children and women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin right here at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Now it just so happens if you look back at chapter 8 and verse 16, you'll see these elders, 25 men, facing the sunrise and they're worshiping the sun in the east. So, <laughs> But the beauty is put a mark on those who weep and sigh over the abominations that are done there. There's not very many men today who really weep and sigh over the terrible, disgusting departures of Christians from the very beautiful truth that God is building today in the spiritual temple, the church, which is his body. But there are those who did. Maurice Johnson was one. 
when he learned it, saw it, and purposed to walk in that truth. Uh, I also point out that when the people there in Ezra's day shouted and praised the Lord. That's a unique statement. It's only found really about three, uh, two other times in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, number one, uh, well, right here. And if we go backwards from here, it was found, stated as an expression made at the time of the temple, when the temple was built uh, under Solomon's reign in uh, Second Chronicles, I believe you'll find that particular expression given. Uh, let me see if I could find it for you. Uh, uh, Second Chronicles, where is it? Uh, Second Chronicles 5, 12 through 13. Uh, verse 12, the Levites who were with the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and the uh, Judutham and their sons, the brethren, they had with cymbals, stringed instruments, harps, and 120 priests standing with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpets and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they had lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, praise the Lord, saying, He is good, his mercy endures forever. The house of the Lord was then filled with the cloud. And so the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. In other words, there was this shout of praise and honor to the Lord and the Lord dwelt, moved into, the Shekinah were moved into residence on that temple. Beautiful at that time. Now I said the other time, the last time, or actually the first time that event took place was at the original creation. And that God tells us back in Job 38, verse 4, the Lord speaks to them at that time, Job and to them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Well, I don't know why he would speak of that, other than he's speaking of the earth now in terms of measuring it out. Who stretched the line upon it? Well, only construction men go out and stretch a line upon the ground to determine the measurements of what they're building. Who put the line upon it? So that and to what were its foundations fastened? Now, the New American Standard Bible, the New International Bible, and the Jewish uh, uh, particular trans, New Jewish translation, but the Jewish Publication Society of America translated that, onto what were its bases sunk? Onto what were its bases sunk? Strictly construction language. Uh, and usually if we're building a foundation today, we uh, sometimes dig deep holes under certain parts of the foundation to go down deeper and to hit a foundation, a uh, rock foundation. So God is describing the earth. What were his foundations fashion? Who laid his cornerstone? And then he adds... That beautiful expression. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, like I say, and it's been observed by others before, that this is exactly what happened when Solomon built the temple and they moved into it. And when Ezra and Nehemiah or Ezra had finished the foundation of the temple, they sang and shouted for praise. God's dwelling place is going to be right here. This should signify to us the importance and beauty of the church that Jesus Christ is building. Uh, of course, and I mentioned before that if you go back and you read Ezekiel 27, read verses 12 through 15, and you'll see that Lucifer himself was the anointed cherub that was going to have a double residence, both at 
the mercy seat in heaven as an anointed cherub that covers, but yet ordained with a gorgeous robe with multiple stones and anointed cherub and be in a garden of God. And this isn't the garden of Eden <laughs> where Adam was because there he's already a fallen creature. This is an Edenic earth that was originally created by God. And there he is with precious stones as a high priest. And many commentators will make that observation. Some of the stones were the same ones that put on the, the breastplate of the priesthood. And he is said to be the anointed cherub who covers. And he was perfect in all of his ways from the day he was created until iniquity was found in him. So if you're going to write a commentary on Genesis 1.1, Quote from Job uh, 38, and then quote from Ezekiel 28, and you'll find that it was originally created in perfection, as it were a sacred temple occupied. Lucifer had two areas of occupancy. He had access to the right hand of God, and he had access as a place here on earth. It was from this place here on earth, that he rebelled, initially rebelled against God, and God brought destruction upon him. And we have the result in chapter, verse 2 of Genesis 1. Then in the third verse, God speaks the six days of rejuvenation of the earth. This all gives you the significance and beauty of God's dwelling place that he chooses on earth at different times. Now, most people don't think of God dwelling on the earth today. Or Jesus Christ was here. He walked on the earth, but he's gone. But it's not true that God's not here. Uh, that's not true. God is here. Christ is here in us, literally in the spirit of God. The spirit is a non-material being. God himself is spirit the Holy Spirit, and Christ himself is a divine spirit who has a permanent body now and his residence in heaven, but he's omniscient and omnipresent. And so he is here by virtue of the Holy Spirit who sent here to place him on earth in us, in his body today. We are the body of Christ on earth today. And we are formed together as Adam was the supreme work of God's creative activity, so the church of Jesus Christ is the supreme work of the spiritual temple that's in existence today. Unless you reverence the truth in God's word about the church of Jesus Christ, it'll be cheap to you and it will be meaningless to you. Christianity will be nothing. But if you realize exactly what God is doing, you will have a deep devotion and a deep appreciation, and the Holy Spirit will strengthen you in your heart and in your life. When any group of Christians begin to lose their appreciation for the work that God is doing and Christ is doing in building this divine institution, why, why, is, think about it, it's the tallest building in the world in that sense, it began 2,000 years, we could say it's got 2,000 levels to it. And, and, and it's continuing to be built. And it's made of living stones. Now, obviously men can't see that. But spiritual Christians can appreciate it because we can see the changed lives of Christians and the harmony and beauty that they will exemplify as they're placed by Jesus Christ in this building. And more than that, it's a body. It's a person, Jesus Christ, in us today. Now, a lot of times people don't see that. Why do they go out and build denominations? Why do they go out and build their church? Because they don't see the reality of the church, which is Christ's body. And as I said before, when Brother Maurice Johnson and others followed him, uh, saw those truths and decided to walk in them, they really had an enjoyable time. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah 
purposed in their hearts to go back and walk in those truths. Um, let me go back here and, and read again from Ezra and, and uh, Nehemiah about the activity. They shouted with great joy when the foundation was laid. And then we're told the adversaries came. And there's always going to be adversaries to Christians who are wanting to walk in the truth that there's one body and we should have no part in man-made religiosity or man-made Christendom and man-made religious organizations. It's blasphemy to the truth of God's word. Uh, adversaries came in Ezra's day and eventually they stopped the construction work. And there was a gap in time. They made terrible claims. This is a rebellious and evil city. To finish these walls and these foundations, it'll bring trouble to the world, they claimed. It was rebellious and harmful and incited sedition in times gone by. Oh my, many accusations against it. Well, as I said before, Maurice Johnson was not a popular man in Los Angeles when he began to walk in the truth of the one body. He had been invited to be the assistant pastor at Church Open Door when he exposed the, fun, the liberalism. But when he began to walk in the truth of the one body, it was offensive to those who were not doing that even though fundamentalists were practicing the fundamental truths of the, of the scriptures with pretending to salvation, they weren't doing it pretending to the church of Jesus Christ. They were still fraternizing with denominations. First thing that happened in Bible school was they took inventory of the different denominations now that are represented in a new class of students. Oh, isn't that wonderful? No, it's sad. There's nothing to brag about it. Yes, Ezra had to wait. It was postponed until they made appeal to Caesar. Uh, later, they said, you hunt in the research uh, under Artaxerxes, and you'll find that Cyrus did give us permission and order to rebuild it, and the research was made and under uh, Artaxerxes, and he sent a letter back. <laughs> I think he gave it to, uh, uh, well, it was sent back eventually in the days of, of, of Darius and Artaxerxes. And it says, in essence, uh, the first year of Cyrus, there was the decree made that the house of the Lord should be built. Uh, and therefore, we should allow these Jews to build that temple again. And they did. And then when Ezra came, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Ezra, we're told, uh, this is Ezra 7, and this is a beautiful verse. Write it down. Ezra said, uh, as told of it, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. In other words, he was not just a preacher of the word. He was going to be a practicer of the word. He was going to put in the shoe leather. The very words that Brother H.G. Ross told me was the difference between the Bible Institute there at that time and how they were walking and why they were so angry with Maurice Johnson per se. We don't just preach the word, we walk in it. And that becomes an offense to people. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances. Then when the Artaxerxes put it in written form that we inform all nations that when these people begin this work that it will not be lawful to impose tax or tribute or custom on any of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, the Nethanim, or the servants of this house of God. In other words, they're not to be taxed. And Ezra wasn't seeking that, but he took advantage of it. That's, that's a proper thing to do. And 
in, in our day, in the United States, history, they've looked upon Christianity and religious organizations as an asset to the nation. It, it strengthens the moral fiber of this country. And therefore, they should not be taxed if they're nonprofit organizations. Well, that's beautiful. And that was a beautiful judgment to make. The only problem that came is that the government today looks out and says, well, okay, nonprofit religious organization be that. What is a nonprofit religious organization? All they saw was Christendom. All of man made religious organizations. And so they decreed that in order to be tax exempt, you have to have a man made organization out here. Something we can see, like a distinctive identifying name. Why, you've got to have uh, bylaws, and you've got to have uh, order in your how you operate. You've got to have a document that tells you how to operate. You've got to have all those things. And so they made that a law. Well, when uh, the saints back in 1960 who had made contributions to the ministry, some of them were being denied the, their uh, allowance to have this deducted from their taxes. And it was happening and it was wrong. So as Ezra appealed to the law, or it was appeal was made there. So we appealed to the courts to make a judgment on that. It was a proper thing to do. And it was a very, very thrilling story when we experienced it at that time. Nothing, of course, to the degree it happened with Ezra and Nehemiah, but at the same time, it was thrilling to a few of us. A remnant, a very small group of people, but nevertheless, it was thrilling to our hearts, and we broadcast it, and you might say we shouted for joy. I think, and have discussed with other folks here, that that was the highlight of Brother Maurice Johnson's ministry when he led us through and were walking with us through, just like Ezra did back here. Now, if I, Maurice was here, he would say, don't compare me to Ezra. I want to walk. He's an example, all right, but Ezra is another brother. Uh, 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 he's got a beautiful place. I'm just a servant of the Lord. Follow me only as I follow Christ. And he said that over and over again, I don't want any Johnsonites around. <laughs> That's the last people I want. I want to walk in the truth by God's grace. I'm not perfect. And, and he wasn't perfect. But he was thrilling in the avenue he went and directed, and it was beautiful, and it was profitable as we moved along. So uh, the uh, next thing that happened, there was when the protest was made, our, th that is when we went to the, to the IRS and said we want to be exempt as the law says. The IRS sent us the Form 1023. Now, next week, <laughs> next message I'm going to give, I'm going to read excerpts from that Form 1023. Because Brother Grace Johnson's means was, of dealing with was, he came to meeting one Sunday morning and laid that form on the pulpit and said, brethren, I want the church here in Los Angeles to fill out this form. This form isn't for us clergymen. It's for the church of Jesus Christ. It's your testimony, and we'll fill it out together. What church are we? And what church are we going to portray before our government? And we had a long meeting, and it was a delight. Well, I'll take you through that meeting, parts of it, at the next meeting. Thank you for listening, and anyway, seeing. Come back again next time. Thank you. The Lord bless you.